Well, Chief Pratt, at least publicly, or maybe to a lot of the people in this country, you and your department seem like an outlier. You just talked about accountability, about transparency, about yeah. reaching out. When so many of the things that, at least in this moment, and, and I could be completely wrong, but it's just what, what people are seeing and talking about, is that there is a lack of transparency. There is a lack of accountability. We see um, police officers in Buffalo get suspended because two of them were charged, and the rest of their unit decides to step down. So it seems like it's more about the brotherhood than about the righteousness. I am I incorrect here? And, and, and if I'm not, how can some of the measures you're taking be placed more throughout this country? Because I think we're talking about progress. Those are the things that people want to see put into action. Well, just like I stated before, you have to go ahead and, and let the folks know that you don't uh, believe that what occurred in Minneapolis is the right thing. And you have to let your officers know the same thing also. You have to let them know that's inexcusable what happened and how that's not going to be tolerated. And with that being said, you go ahead and you let your officers know, listen, we are not that type of, uh, you all are not those type of officers. You all are better than that. And with that being said, we're going to go ahead, move forward, and make sure that we're showing the world, the country, that we are the type of department that's not going to stand for that. And your leader's not going to stand for that. So I think if you push that message out, and on all levels, I'm, I'm also a part of the Miami-Dade Chiefs of Police Association. I'm on the board. And we have one voice. All of us believe in this concept of, Listen, if you do something wrong, you admit to it, you move on from there. If someone has a question about something, you go ahead and you explain exactly why we're doing certain things, why we should not do certain things. And also, on another avenue, we're all looking at our policies and our procedures to make sure we're on one accord. And I think that's very, very important. Sebastian, as a member of the Players Coalition, a lead in your locker room, if you were to go into your locker room and say, hey, look, we need to find ways to work with police to help maybe get them to reform. How would the guys in your locker room right now look at you? To be honest, I think guys would be more than glad to do that right now because at all time high, there's a huge lack of communication between obviously certain areas of this country and the police, you know. Um, I think, like I said, like I said prior with Chief what the chief is doing is outstanding, but unfortunately, I don't. Know, we do not feel that that's a consistent thing throughout this country. So, just being able to get out there and and connect with the police to to for them to kind of see the issues, the issues in which we are having, and hopefully bridging the gap between between the officers and. And obviously, our community will just be a huge thing for us, and be a, po a positive, a positive thing for our communities as well. So, so TD, I mean, look, player activism is nothing new. How can players, how can NFL players actually lead? Because look, I've seen when people get to meet you, you're a Hall of Famer. Anything you say to them impacts their life. And so, if you go out and say something to them about being better or leading in a certain way, how, how do you think that could get people? to kind of, you know, piggyback and follow the momentum of what some of the things Sebastian was just talking about. Yeah, it's huge, Steve, because you talked about it. You know, people not only follow us when we're on the football field, but if we make statements about uh, social, you know, consciousness and things that are happening, people will follow. And so we have not only a voice, but we have a duty and, a, and an obligation to our community to be able to speak up and speak out on issues like this and be able to guide young men, young women who don't really know what to do at this point. So, you know, we have to be a beacon of light for them. We have to be uh, a calm voice. We have to be a rational voice. But we have to come with solutions that people mm -hmm. don't have right now. And I, I challenge anybody, I challenge myself to do more, to be more involved in our community, to be able to help people navigate through these times and try to bridge that gap. Because the only way it gets better is that the relationship between law enforcement and the community has to improve, it has to. And there's gotta be a little bit of understanding on both sides. There's a lot of talking going on on both sides. There's gotta be some listening going on and really you know, diving deep into what are the fundamental issues and why 
we're having this, this long discussion. I mean, a lot of these issues have come from many, many years ago, and it's embedded in, in, in sort of a thinking process. You know, the way we think, the mindset that we have toward law enforcement, that has to change. And law enforcement's mm -hmm. attitude towards the communities that they serve, that has to change. But yes, the, we have a voice. People listen to us when we say stuff, and so we have to speak out more. And, I, and it seems like more people are doing that, which is really good to see. Chief Pratt, well, one thing we often hear when it comes to, hey, if we want to make a difference in black communities, more black people or Latino people, whatever, they need to join the police force. You clearly have had success in your climb in law enforcement. But there's also, and you probably know this, some people looking at why would you want to become a police officer? You're, that means you're going over to that side. What, what about that situation? Because is, is, is it important having more representation of people of color, especially in communities of color, wearing the blue? And, and, but what about also them fighting, be it peer pressure, be it perception, that if you do become a police officer, that all of a sudden you're turning back on the community where maybe you came from? Well, first and foremost, I, I want the best of the best. Uh, it doesn't matter to me, white, Hispanic, black, I want the best of the best. Uh, just so happens, though, uh, one of the things that I did do uh, under the, the leadership of uh, Mayor Oliver Gilbert was I went ahead and made a connection with our uh, local uh, university, Florida Memorial University, and had a conversation with them about internship and reaching out to their criminal justice uh, um, major and see exactly how can we bond with the individuals that are studying criminal justice? Do they have aspirations of being police officers? And if so, how do we get them from point A to point B? In addition to that, I just went ahead and I started looking at the files and, and seeing are they individuals who live in the community? If they live in the community, why not be a part of this police department? If you, if you think that change is needed, then why not be part of the change? That's how I look at it, you know? And uh, just continuously reaching out, doing presentations in different places. And after doing that, 50% of our police department is uh, black. Um, so, I, I, my main thing, though, is I just want the best of the best. It's great to have representation. I have a lot of individuals who grew up in this neighborhood and they wanted to come back and be a part of, of this program that I have here. Um, me, this is like a 360 for me. When I, when, just like I stated, when I first started my um, law enforcement career, I started right here in this neighborhood. So it's like I'm coming back home. But you want individuals who are vested, who take time to walk the streets, to talk to people. They know Mrs. Smith on the corner. They know Mrs. Smith on the corner. You want individuals like that to just take time and want to be here. And that's the type of individuals that I really want. My father-in-law, he's an L.A. County uh, sheriff. He's actually a watch commander. And so we've, I've had conversations with him throughout the last 10 years. And it's, you know, it's fascinating to hear sort of both sides of it. And he comes from some, some of the... Uh, the same things you talked about and, and his approach to the community and how he was involved and he knew all the people in, in that community. And I always thought that that was the, you know, the right approach. Um, your question I have for you, though, is, is the question is talking about on a national scale. How yeah. is there any national type of organization that you're a part of that can help implement the program that you have in Miami throughout the nation so that it becomes more of that kind of community uh, involvement and, and being involved in the community you serve versus kind of police in that community? Is there any national well, organization? There's Exactly. There's Noble. And I'm a part of the Noble, which is, uh, you know, the law enforcement black executives. Uh, I'm part of that group. And that is the national stage right there. Uh, the current president is Chief Davis. And she's been on a couple of uh, panels lately talking about diversity and, and how can we be better. Uh, as far as policing. And uh, I think that national stage, and they have a lot of training courses and, and really what their main thing is training, training the executives and, and pushing out the information and trying to do different uh, um, recruitments of individuals. I think that is one of the best platforms uh, that we have out there that can actually recruit a lot of folks on the police departments that we have. I think I think all that's very important, and 
and it's and it's amazing to me to, to hear that that they are they are awesome things like that that are established but it's crazy to me as well just to just to see that that there's still obviously more work that needs to be done to, in order for us to bridge that gap between our officers and and the community as well um Chief is doing an amazing job. That's so awesome just to be able to hear all those things, all those things that she's doing in our community. And uh, I feel like, I feel like uh, what the chief is doing is is a uh, is light years ahead of his time, obviously, for what's going on around this country. So, you know, I just commend the chief. That's awesome. All right, so Sebastian, I'm gonna I'm gonna start with this because, of course, a big topic of conversation, and I think the wording of this is it just throws all of us off, and that's defunding the police. So it sounds like you're going to take away all of the money, there's going to be no police officers, and we're going to have anarchy. Yeah. But when you really kind of get to it, it sounds more like maybe redirecting funds, um, sure. putting them in places to help police officers, to maybe establish things in the community. So, yeah. you know, Sebastian, when, when we're talking about maybe, you know, you know, the corrections that need to be made, some of the changes that need to be made, instead of defunding the police, where do you think are areas that money could be better spent Again, so we have things to level off some of the issues, you know, that we're seeing really surface in, in, in a big way right now. Uh, one of the things that the chief already already uh, mentioned is just communities being able to host host those youth events, hosting those youth events, so our so our youth can know the officers and know that officers are on their side. Also, um, uh, I'd say I'd probably say the biggest one of the biggest things is. Um, education, education and learning, learning the, the people that, the people that the, these officers are working with. Um, at the end of the day, communication is the hardest skill. Um, me being a professional football player, I know that communication is a, is a skill that, that's truly learned over time. And I feel as if we're able to, if we're able to invest our money into not only communication, but also learning, learning, um, Different ethnic groups, different um, different minority groups, and being able to to for our officers to learn them and study them and and know and know their community very well, then that will honestly that will honestly help officers de-escalate and defuse situations rather than it going to that next level of violence when violence has to be taken place. But at the end of the day, um, you can't have empathy towards towards somebody. If you don't know, if you don't know where they're from, their background, uh, you know their struggles. So I feel like being able to re redirect that money into 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 edu into ed the education process of 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 communities and minority groups and things and such will definitely help um, in the future with our officers in the community and bridging that gap. I think that's important. Education is very, very important. Also, the training of the officers and making sure that you do some real life training with them, whether it be implicit bias training that we do, where we can go through scenarios and, and understand and have that hard talk with them. Why is it that this person is acting this way when this situation happens? You know, why did, does this culture act this way when this type of situation happens? Not only that, I, I was talking to my, my boss about. Uh, the mental stability of the officers, making sure that we invest in that too, because we need to find out what's going on, what's 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 happening with our officers. Is there something personal at home that's happening that makes them react a little bit differently when they come on the professional platform? So that area right there is is important also. And I think the funding has to do with balancing the books and just make sure you have the funds in the right area. That way you can go ahead and you can do the best job possible as far as policing your community. Yeah, I think I think also with some of these funds as well as is, is we talked about education, but it's really about technology. I mean, because, you know, some of these communities, we're, we're getting left behind. You know, we, we don't have tablets. We don't have iPads and things of that nature in some of our school systems. We talk about jobs. We talk about some mental health programs that could be used for in the community. We talk about the infrastructure of providing this uh, sort of self-sustaining system uh, in our communities that, that that those funds can go towards. So, yeah, this, those funds can go towards a lot of different things. I don't know about the total, you know, 
this 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 banding of, of the police uh, department that that's that's a bit you know radical there. But I certainly think there's there's ways that you can use those funds not only to police those issues or problems, but use the money to prevent those problems. And I think that's what they're saying by stating that they can reallocate those funds. And um, listen, I, I think the more you can you can give people hope and give people an opportunity to 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 flourish. I think that's going to directly affect their their encounters with law enforcement. I mean, it's proven when you have people who have higher education, people who have jobs, people who have um, services to deal with, whether it's mental health, whether it's with rehab or with drugs, you know, those things really help. And a lot of those programs are underfunded. And so um, I think that there should be a major push um, to get some of those funds allocated to those, uh, those uh, programs. Well, Sebastian, Chief Pratt, and TD, our Hall of Famer, thanks so much for joining us on this important panel. We're really going to discuss a lot of issues surrounding policing and policing the police and community involvement. And on that note, Chief Pratt, we know down in Miami Gardens you've done a lot of projects with the Miami Dolphins, and you have a very successful community policing approach. Could you tell us about actually what you do in the community policing space and, and how was it and is it even as is it even as easy now to establish trust with the community? Well, the first thing, Steve, that I had to do was um, because I I'm new to this area uh, the second time around. Let me say, uh, when I first started my career 27 and a half years ago, I worked in this area, but I've only been the chief of this particular police department for the last three years. So I had to get reestablished in the community, uh, get to know, I call them the VIPs, the ones who are over uh, the community um, groups and, you know, get familiar with them and talk to them about things that they're doing in order for us to, as the police, be along the same lines and do a lot of the same things that they would want us to do. Um, after I did that, then I made sure I, I attended a lot of their meetings, listened to a lot of their concerns. Uh, took a lot of notes because, uh, you know, they had a lot of concerns about what was going on in the neighborhood and then meet with my team members to figure out exactly um, how we were going to tackle this. Uh, community policing is so very, very important. And I always talk about the two spectrums. You have the youth on one end, you have the seniors on the other end. So how do you balance that? The seniors want certain things and the youth need certain things. So one of the things that I did was uh, when I sat down with the seniors, I made sure that we developed some programs for them. Uh, we had a senior appreciation day. That was uh, something that we implemented so that we can show our love and appreciation to them because they have a lot of wisdom. And then on the other end, make sure that we generate uh, such programs as our police athletic league so that uh, we can involve the youth in a lot of different activities because if you have youth that have uh, nothing to do what do they say about idle minds? They get into trouble, you know? So we wanted to make sure that we uh, interacted with the youth. Uh, we had various uh, youth basketball games with them um, and also made sure that we worked in partnership with uh, the uh, school police to make sure that the youth see us within the schools. In addition, we implemented the uh, Big Brothers, uh, Big Sisters program where we have basically 25 to 26 individuals on the police department that are engaged with our youth. They're mentors to our youth. And I'm also a mentor. I've been a mentor for the last three years to uh, three different uh, young ladies, uh, two of which are in college right now. And just make sure we continuously have that conversation with our youth because you want to ensure them that you're here for them, that you are vested in, you know, in, in their needs and uh, go from there. So that's a couple of things that we've done. Well, I want to kind of get to the issue of trust now, building trust with the community and the police. And, Sebastian, I want to start with you. We know you're a member of the NFL's Players Coalition, but you're also the resident 20-something on this panel. And, you know, you're hearing about all the success that Chief Pratt is having in her community, but when we look at the images on TV, when we see some of the things that have happened on video cameras with, uh, you know, unarmed black people being killed by police and whatnot, it seems like there is a lack of trust. And, 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 and I want to start with you, Sebastian. I want everybody to chime in. But is, there, is it going to be hard now for people to, to trust the police, or harder, I should say, 
because of the things we've seen and because of the momentum right now that, that's calling so much for so much police reform? Uh, most definitely, Steve. I think it, it is going to be an issue right now. But, you know, having amazing officers like the chief here that are able to really dive deep into the issues and recognize our youth and recognize also the OGs and the, the people that are important that have been around and, uh, and give them wisdom is very important. It's, it's at an all-time high right now. I think, honestly... The biggest thing that we just have to see as Americans is just action being being taken for for the for the issues that have been brought to the surface now due to flip do our phones and being able to record everything. And uh, that's what I have to really say about that. Yeah, I, I think we, when it comes to trust, what what people are wanting to see uh, to bridge that trust gap is to see the equality in terms of how it's being, um, you know, played out in, in, in the in judicial system, in terms of, you know, when we, when we commit a crime or something happens as a civilian, it's pretty swift in what happens. There's an arrest, you get locked up, you go to trial, um, and things happen pretty uh, swiftly, and they, they happen transparently. We see what happens. I think when it comes to law enforcement, where people are not happy about it. Most of that stuff seems like it happens behind closed doors and the decisions that are made where they don't understand the outcome and how certain things are being prosecuted, how certain things are not being prosecuted. And so I think once that becomes uh, where things are put out and where we can see the process and how it's being handled through a system, then I think that starts to build the trust. But Chief Pratt says something that I really like is that when she first got into her position, she made the, the outreach, right? She went out to the community to try to figure out who, the, who are the leaders in the community? What are the needs? And I always felt like that's the biggest thing is that you have sometimes law enforcement who work a, you know, 20 miles away and they never go to the community that they serve. And they only go there to work there. And that to me always has been a fundamental, you know, always crazy to me, like, how is that possible? To me, if I worked in law enforcement, I want to get to know who I'm, who I'm serving. Like, let me... Let me understand who's there and try to, you know, get it on the same level as them to understand what the needs are, because it makes my job a lot easier. So the program that I know Chief Pratt has down in Miami seems like it's working, and that needs to be implemented throughout every precinct in, the, in America to bring that trust with the community and, and law enforcement. And not only that, I think as a leader, uh, I, I don't stay within the four walls that that's my office. I'm constantly out there in the neighborhoods, constantly out there with uh, my officers. So I want them to see me and I want them to see the actions that I do in order to emulate uh, what I do out there. In addition, uh, I, from the get-go, I talked about transparency, making sure that we're held accountable for our actions, talked about uh, professionalism, making sure that we're fair with everybody. And if there's something that goes against the grain, deal with it at that at that time. And that's what I'm about. And I, I consistently preach that. I consistently go to the various roll calls that my individuals have and just keep on letting them know that, yes, we are a good department. We can be even better. But if we make mistakes, we're going to have to admit to the mistakes that we're making and go from there. Earlier this week, Sebastian, you wrote a letter or an article, I should say, for medium.com about the education and the financial disparity gaps affecting communities of color. Could you talk about that and maybe how what you wrote about could impact everything we've been discussing here? For sure. And um, obviously, you know, there's no, there's obviously not one solution to this issue that in which we're having. But um, yeah, so I wrote, I essentially wrote an op-ed uh, um, just urging the Senate and the administration to team up um, in-house to pass the HEROES provisions addressed for education inequities and the digital divide. See, um, it even goes so deep in, in even our education system, you know, where there's certain schools that, that are provided uh, more money, uh, more opportunity. Uh, kids are able to 
have a vast, a vast ma more majority of pickings to learn about, you know, and that ultimately is leading to a lack of representation in places of in places of power in this country, not just power, but um, places of of importance. So, you know, I'm just what I do in my op ed is that I'm just you know stating that you know offering equal equal opportunity in education to particularly families of low income, families that are compromised, family families of 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 uh, black and brown communities, um, would help with our problems tenfold, you know? Cause like I said before, if there's a lack of representation, if there's a lack of representation of of a of a of a ethnicity or 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 a type of people, then how can you ever relate? How can you ever stop certain issues from happening? So um for sure, you know, that's that's really was my op ed about. And it's just addressing and shedding light. And especially with the COVID, with the COVID night due to COVID nineteen uh those issues that were once swept under the rug rug can be now and because due to the digital divide because a lot of those communities can't afford tablets can't afford laptops uh can't afford any of those things in which they, they're able to go to school in you know so um the op-ed addresses that and i put facts in there you know about uh facts in there about you know that are backing up backing up my statements obviously and uh, yeah, that that's really what it's about. And I, I really believe that one of the solutions is that it starts within our schools as well, you know. And um, once we're able to address that, then hopefully get the provisions passed, um, then I feel like it'll it'll bridge the digital divide and also bridge that gap that gap within our school systems to to lead to, you know, more diverse and uh, more more well-rounded. Um, representation in places of importance in this country. Yeah, it's an absolutely fantastic article. I mean, go to medium.com and it, it, it really explains a lot of that. So let's continue. And, and the last thing, um, and, and I, I want everyone to chime in on this because this is important. We talked a little bit earlier, Chief, transparency, accountability, policing the police. Because a lot of times, if a police officer who does wrong, he may be charged, suspended or whatnot, but then it kind of goes out of law enforcement's hand it kind of goes to the district attorney or the judicial part of this and and a lot of people are talking that they want to see the officers in the george floyd killing go to jail or what happened in brunswick georgia with ahmaud arbery and and td i'm going to start this with you is that again this is this part's out of law enforcement's hands for the most part is, is seeing the prosecution of bad police officers is that possibly the first step and maybe the most significant step in building trust in the system? I think absolutely. And I've said that. I think people want to see a system that they're, that applies not only to what they do, but also to, to law enforcement. You know, if I were to go out there and, and, and something happens, if I commit a crime, the first thing that happens to me, I get arrested. And then I get, I get charged, I get booked, I go, I go to jail, they hold me. And then there's some type of arraignment and they, you know, they charge me with some type of crime. And we've seen too many times where we're scratching our heads like, wait a minute, we just witnessed basically a murder. And the law enforcement, they, they're not charged. Then they, 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 they kind of have this mentality of, well, let's just wait and see. Let's just, we don't want to rush the judgment. Let's wait before we press any charges, charges or do anything. And I think that's what people are like, wait a minute, we, we need to see the wheels of justice turn the same at the same rate, the same you know, speed as it would apply to civilians. And so you, we talk about not only being charged, but now we have to talk about a trial. And now we have to go through this thing of selecting jurors and going, going through and see if there's a, a conviction. And when, you, when that goes down and if it's not what people expect it to be, then that really is going to be leading to the more of, of distrust because what we think we saw, what we know we saw, on some of these videos is we saw murder. And if that's not the outcome of a trial, that's gonna lead to more people saying that the system is just not working. It hasn't worked for, for many black people for years. And that's what's been the fundamental problem of seeing that. So um, I think there has to be not only the trial, but there has to be a, a conviction for a uh, majority of people to say, yes, okay, now we're finally seeing this system, system work. 
Yes, exactly what you're saying, TD. I feel like action needs to be taking place. And at the end of the day, listen, like, this is the now. This is the analogy I'm going to use. If if I'm trust will never be given. If I'm on the football field and, I, and I'm and I'm playing, and I'm messing up five times a game, I'm not going to be trusted enough to go out there and play. You know what I'm saying? So it's just kind of the same thing with with these officers. They need to be held accountable. I feel like trust will be given to them once they're held accountable for their actions. You know, um, killing killing a woman, killing a woman. In the, when she's just sleeping in the car, you know, or killing a man for sleeping in the car isn't isn't justifiable. Those aren't things that 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 should be allowed. And and for the fact that there've been such issues with there've been issues in situations that things have been pro, prolonged and 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 somehow there've been there've been reasons that they aren't they aren't they aren't going to trial and things have been held up and all that and all those other things, all those crazy creating those crazy instances it isn't giving people trust confidence that 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 the police are necessarily on their side they feel as if that the police are necessarily against them they're working together as as a group as as their team and and they're they're not holding each other accountable so i think accountability and um transparency is just a huge thing that needs to be addressed and that needs to be shown on a large on a large scale um and once that happens, once that's that's established, then then the trust will be given, and um, that's what I have to say about that. I agree with you both. Uh, from a leadership standpoint, it's important that we show that this type of behavior is not condoned, um, because a lot of times people think about the the thin blue line, and that how you know we're into protecting each other. We're not into protecting bad behavior. You have a lot of great officers, but we don't want bad cops because it makes us look bad, the ones that are doing good things. So we want the same thing that you all want. We want to weed out the bad and make sure that we keep on, um, you know, getting even better with the good ones that we have uh, on our departments. So just making sure that we are um, showing that, like I said before, this is not the type of um, professionalism. This is not uh, fair, respectable behavior, and uh, they need to be held accountable. I'm, I'm in total agreement. And make sure that as leaders, we push that information down to our officers so they understand exactly what our viewpoint on and, and, and exactly where we stand on this issue. Chief, if I could follow up, we are hearing a lot of talk from players we've spoken to uh, doing these roundtables, though, about Police unions, I mean, making it difficult for you and others to weed out the bad cops. I mean, is that, is that a pressure point? Is that something that, that's, that's tough for you guys to kind of get through in, in trying to have the type of force that you want to have? It could be a, a long, tedious process. Um, the officers are obviously offered due process. Um, sometimes you have to go ahead and hit the switch and you might have to go in a different direction, but the officers are um, given due process and sometimes it could be, um, you know, dragged on and, and the union can be uh, against the leadership. However, is it coming upon you before things happen that you have a good relationship with the union as far as having discussions, having dialogue, so you can understand each other's side and exactly how we're going to go uh, forward in a professional manner, because at the end of the day, I believe that both sides want uh, what's right. I, I, I can't believe that the unions don't want something that's that's wrong. Um, they have to know that, um, just for instance, what happened in Minneapolis, that that was wrong behavior, um, and, and that wasn't the norm, and that should not be the norm. And if they are uh, spearing that, that information out there to their folks, then it's a coming upon the membership to get rid of the, the, the union leadership because they shouldn't want representation like that. 